is the Martin Luther King birthday, holiday weekend, and so obviously I'm, be going, I'm going to begin this morning's sermon with a sermon. I'm going to begin this morning's sermon apologizing for my phlegm-addled brain to begin with. It's going to be one of those mornings. And two, to tell you that obviously I'm going to talk about last week's Golden Globes for the holiday. I don't know if you tuned in or not to the festivities as Hollywood's best and brightest were awarded for their achievements over the year by the Hollywood Foreign Press. But if you did, then you saw... Almost every woman nominated or a guest dressed in black in solidarity with a movement called Time's Up, speaking up against sexual abuse and sexual harassment in the entertainment industry. And they brought with them activists from outside of the Hollywood sphere to bring their point home, to talk about pay inequality, to talk about sexual abuse, to talk about the rights of women around the world and leveraging their power as celebrity to bring these issues into light. This is the actress Michelle Williams, and she is standing next to Tarana Burke, who is the founder of the Me Too movement. You may have heard about it in the last few months. It was a sight to see. It brought the issues into sharp relief, and almost immediately, as The event was unfolding because we work at the speed of social media now. The blowback started coming as well. Oh my goodness, they're just a bunch of celebrities in $100,000 dresses. What could this possibly mean? This is just slacktivism. Doesn't mean anything. These are just actors. They should stick to acting. They shouldn't talk about these political things. This is meaningless. And it's not really a problem, is it? I mean, they're just exaggerating what's going on. It's not an uncommon response when people are trying to bring issues of justice into the forefront of our collective consciousness. You're exaggerating. It's not real. Who are you to speak about this? Why is this your issue? Somebody else should deal with it. It's not your problem. The same response we have heard to NFL players taking a knee during the national anthem throughout this football season. It's not a real problem. Racism is done. What are these millionaires whining about? Or, as has been done in the case of taking a knee, changing the narrative outright. They're doing this to disrespect our flag, our military, our country. It's not about what they say it's about. It's not about protesting police brutality in our nation. It's what I say it is. And it's the response to the Women's March of last January, and I'm sure it'll be the response to the hundreds of women's marches across the country next Sunday as well on the first anniversary of that march. What are they whining about? It's not a problem. Equality is real. Get a life, go back to your kitchens, be quiet, be quiet, it's not a problem. Quit stirring up the pot, quit being so extreme. Go home, let us do our thing and you go do your thing. Who are you to demand justice? What injustice could you possibly be suffering anyway? This is not an uncommon response to the cry for justice by those who are oppressed or marginalized in our country. Those who feel the crush of inequality and hatred. And it has been the story, not just this year, but for decades and decades. It's the story of the response to Dr. King that prompted him to write his letter from the Birmingham jail. In April of 1963, Dr. King and his cohorts had been engaging in a boycott 
of white-owned businesses in the city of Birmingham in order to try to force some sort of negotiation with the city government around their segregationist policies and around the violence that black people were experiencing in the city. And after months, that boycott had not led to any sort of open door to dialogue with the city government. And so Dr. King and his friends realized that they were going to have to take a little bit more direct action. And so they arrived in Birmingham to march, counter to the current law of the city, which required permits in order to parade. They marched through the streets of the city, and they were arrested for the crime of parading without a permit. Dr. King was placed into solitary confinement. He was not expecting this, but he was impressed with the tactic that Bull Connor had engaged in. Oh, he's a smart cracker, said MLK. And he was left to sit in solitary in jail. For a while, he was denied access to his attorneys until the United States government, the president, wrote to intervene with the government to give him his due process rights. And when he was finally able to see his lawyer, he was brought a copy of the newspaper from April 12th of that year, in which an open letter had been written by eight prominent clergymen of the city of Birmingham, Christian and Jewish religious leaders who talked about themselves as the moderates, not opposed to the cause of equality for blacks in Birmingham, but opposed to King's methods and to King's presence in the city himself. They wrote about seeking unity. A King who had been in something of a bit of despair as he sat in prison, worried that perhaps his tactics of nonviolent direct action would not have the effect that he thought they might seek, all of a sudden found a sense of renewed purpose in this critique that had been hurled at him and at his methods. And so he took up pencil, and being in solitary, having no books for research, no notes to read from, began an impassioned defense of himself and his methods and turned the critiques of those eight moderate clergymen back on them into what became the letter from a Birmingham jail, writing it in the margins of the very newspaper that was brought to him by his lawyer, and when he ran out of space there onto the rough-grained toilet paper of his cell, sneaking out the notes bit by bit through his lawyers to go back to his secretary in their makeshift office at a hotel so that, as he said, she could somehow decipher his chicken scrawl and turn it into something readable. It was, by the end, 21 double-spaced pages of text, 7,000-plus words and today considered after his I Have a Dream speech probably his most seminal statement on the work that he did. It is an intense piece of reading. Like I said, I struggled with whether or not to just read it out loud to you and let that be the lesson for the day. But instead I wanna highlight the arguments in his letter that were calling out to me on this reading this year in light of everything going on in our country today. The critiques of his opponents and his responses to them. First of all, the clergyman of Birmingham objected to the presence of King in their city at all. He was from Atlanta. What did he have to do with the city of Birmingham at all? This is a local problem, and you, you are an interloper, and why would you bother coming here? This is not your problem. King wrote, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the 8th century prophets left their little villages and carried their thus saith the Lord far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns, and just as the Apostle Paul left his little village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to practically every hamlet and city of the Greco-Roman world, I too am compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my particular hometown. Like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere 
is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow, provincial, outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider. You're not from here. It's not your problem. How often do we hear that refrain today as the cries for justice come out? Or in the reverse, when we hear the cry for justice, it's not my problem. I don't live there. We don't have that problem here. Why are we even talking about this? King puts himself in the context of the biblical prophets and the apostle Paul, not to inflate his own ego or say that he is any better or on a level with them, but to put himself in the context of one called to do hard work, the work of justice, because the justice that is demanded is the same in Atlanta or Birmingham, in Los Alamos or Española, in the United States or around the world. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, and we must answer that call, he says. If this sounds like a familiar concept, you've probably heard me say similar things before. We are all saved, or none of us are. We are all bound together. That's a universalist theology that King is expressing here. And that should speak to our own hearts here this morning. There is no such thing as an outsider when we recognize we are all bound together. Having done away with that argument, he takes on their next one. And to me, the crux of the letter, the longer reading I gave you earlier here. Can't you just wait? say his correspondence. Just give it time. It'll take care of itself. After all, haven't you yourself said the arc of the universe bends towards justice? Parentheses eventually. No, we cannot wait, King says. And he proceeds to give this moving, horrifying laundry list the indignities and the injustices and the terror of the soul and the heart and the body that black people in this country experienced for 340 years, as he said. As if to say, can't you understand? But outright telling his correspondence, you can't understand this. You've never experienced this. But if you can't understand it, can you at least believe me? Can you believe us that this horror is real? This for me right now is the heart of the letter because the implication in the weight asked for by his correspondence is this notion that it's not as big of a problem as you think it is. It's not a problem at all. Why are you getting all worked up about this now? The implication is, this is not real. And so King gives his testimony to the reality of the horrors. If you can't understand, can you at least believe what I'm telling you? That's a hard ask for many of us especially if we live our lives in relative comfort because to open ourselves to believing the horrific from others around us is to create a crisis of conscience, is to recognize that the world is not as comfortable as we might experience it, that we might have to live outside our own experience. 
And it's a hard thing for human beings to do. One, because I'm sorry, we tend to be a little self-centered. And especially among those of us who consider ourselves to be rational human beings, my experience, what I take in through my own senses, that's the heart of everything. That's, that's how I know the world. You're giving me something that does not compute with what I take in day in and day out. Well, in my experience, that's what the clergy of Birmingham were really saying to King. And those are conversations we're still having today. I recently got into a long, drawn-out, three-hour-long circular argument with someone that kept coming back to, well, in my experience, well, in my experience. It was an argument about why it really was kind of creepy to compliment women you don't know on their looks on the street, how that wasn't a free speech issue, it was really just kind of an issue of respect and not being a creep. And it kept coming back to, for this person, well, in my experience, they appreciate that. Well, how do you know? Well, they nod and they smile. Do you not realize that that's the women's silent language for shut up and leave me alone, please? Well, how am I supposed to know that? In my experience, oh, Jesus, three hours it went on like this. And it's not the first conversation that I've had with someone like this that keeps coming back to the argument of, in my experience, in my experience. And I'm going to be honest, and please don't take this the wrong way, more often than not, it's older white males who come back to this argument again. It's not exclusive, but more often than not. And the thing is, we've got to... Find some way to get over ourselves. What I finally came to, the argument I wished I'd had, I had one of those I wish I said moments, was this. If we're going to approach this purely from demographics, okay, my experience is, is pretty, pretty solid, yes, but it is one data point out of millions. And if we're completely honest, the observer might be just a little biased. So we've got to take in a little more. We've got to hear what is being said to us and believe it even if we can't understand it. Embrace the horror of it even though it might hurt to think about. We need to, in the words of Brian Stevenson, who was our Ware lecturer at General Assembly, we need to get proximate to people's, ex people whose experiences are different from our own. Hear them and accept them and know them. Because the experiences are real. And we should be shattered by them. And once we are, we have no choice really but to respond. Which is what Dr. King and his allies were doing. A response was necessary once you understand or at least believe the horror of what is going on. But do you need to rock the boat so much? His correspondents ask. Do you need to upset the status quo? I mean, geez louise, there's just so much tension in the city now. You sit here marching through the streets. Don't you realize how upsetting that is? I mean, isn't the ultimate goal peace? They ask. Isn't that what we want? Don't we just want peace? Sure, says King. Peace is absolutely what we're looking for here. We are in agreement about that. But, what sort of peace is it that we're looking for? He writes this, and it hurts to read, and it hurts to hear, but it is the truth. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the last few years, I've been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. 
I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and establish such creative tension that a community that has consistently refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. I just referred to the creation of tension as part of the work of the nonviolent resistor. This may sound rather shocking, but I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly worked and preached against violent tension. But there is a type of constructive nonviolent tension that is necessary for growth. We must see the need of having nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men to rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. So the purpose of direct action is to create a situation so crisis-packed that it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. What kind of peace do you want? the absence of tension, or the presence of justice. I am not afraid of the word tension, says King. And nor can we be, truly, because tension, when harnessed for the good, is a creative force. There is no change without tension. If you are looking to upset the, st upset the status quo, tension is inevitable. It will be a crisis, but a crisis is not in and of itself a bad thing. We are a naturally conflict-avoidant people, at least when it comes to the big issues. We like to fight about the small stuff all the time because it distracts us from having to have the conversations and the tension around the big stuff. We don't want to talk about inequality of gender, so we'll just have petitions to get Disney to apologize for making a woman a powerful user of the force in the new Star Wars movie, because that'll change the world, right? These are what my colleague, the Reverend Nancy McDonald Ladd, calls the fake fights, the conflicts we get into so we don't have to have the real changing conflict, but tension when we engage in it around the big issues, is the creative force. The results of Dr. King's own work during the Civil Rights Movement point to that very fact. The tension he caused was deliberate and it had the effect that he was desired. It created crises in the consciousness of Americans nationwide, watching on television as dogs and fire hoses were turned on fellow human beings watching peaceful demonstrators be approached with horrific violence caused some tension in the minds of people around the country, caused a crisis in conscience that had no choice but to be resolved and to be resolved for many in the direction of that step towards freedom. Tension transforms. So yes, yes, we have to rock the boat, says King. Fine, but do you have to be so extreme about it, say his correspondents? Do you have to go so far for it? Well, what is extremism, asks King. What do you mean by extremists? I must admit, he writes, I was initially disappointed in being so categorized. But as I continued to think about the matter, I gradually gained a bit of satisfaction from being considered an extremist. Was not Jesus an extremist in love? 
Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, pray for them that despitefully use you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Was not Paul an extremist for the gospel of Jesus Christ? I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. Was not John Bunyan an extremist? I will stay in jail to the end of my days before I make a mockery of my conscience. Was not Abraham Lincoln an extremist? This nation cannot survive half slave and half free. Was not Thomas Jefferson an extremist? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. Will we be extremists for hate or will we be extremists for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or will we be extremists for the cause of justice? Is there any such thing as extremity in the name of love, in the name of justice? Can we truly ever go too far in the name of those values? If so, great. Call me an extremist. I will take that name up with pride, he says. There was never a reply from the eight clergymen to King's response to them. The letter was published in myriad publications after he wrote it. Indeed, it became the heart of King's own book, Why We Can't Wait, in explaining why they did the work that they did. But while there wasn't an answer in the form of a letter, while the correspondence did not continue. The letter from a Birmingham jail has served as inspiration and spark for many over what is now 55 years for dissidents around the world, Václav Havel in Prague, Andrei Sakharov in Russia, people jailed for their consciousness around the world have clung to these arguments, these challenges to our own sense of moderation. And those challenges are still ours to answer today. King is challenging the conscience of the church in the United States as much as it has served as an inspiration for secular and religious alike. And here we are at the beginning of 2018, sitting in another point in the cycle of history where the demands for justice among women and people of color, among lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual people, among immigrants and refugees, among the marginalized around the world, among the dehumanized around the world, that cry is louder and louder. It feels like a cacophony. It can be overwhelming to hear that call over and over again from every corner, from every identity. But if we are indeed a church that is called to justice, how will we respond to that call from specific people for specific means of justice? Do we close our ears and say, la, 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 I can't hear you? To drown out the noise? Or will we be those moderates? Write to those rocking the boat to say, can't you just be quieter about it? Let time heal all wounds? Aren't you going a little overboard? Are you sure that's what you're really, really angry about? Or will we hear the call of our own universalism telling us 
that injustice everywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. That we have a part to play in the work of justice in the world, no matter where it might be. That we can do it from where we are right now. And recognizing that, Will we believe only what we see with our own eyes? Or will we be open-minded and open-eyed and open-hearted enough to believe the testimony of those around us saying, this is horrific. Maybe you can't understand, but would you at least please believe and accepting that reality as part of our own experience can we find enough strength in ourselves to lean into the inevitable tension that is going to arise when we recognize we must do something, that change is coming and it doesn't come without a little crisis and a little tension? And leaning into that tension, can we find the courage to say yes? I am an extremist for love and for justice, for equality for all, for the values I express with my lips week after week in the bosom of my church. Will that be my answer? Our correspondent awaits our reply.